Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 5th of May and a pretty quick update this week. As always, I have the chapters for the few updates there are, so you can jump to the one you care about the most. New videos this week, I did a deep dive into the Windows Local Administrator Password Solution. How can I take care of the complexity, take care of the rotation, and give me the ability to go and get that local administrator password for all of the machines that are under my corporate governance. And I can store that either in Azure AD, which would be the preferred approach, or just in Active Directory Domain Services. So I go through that solution. And then did a video about Azure AD Hybrid Join, what it is, and when maybe you may need to use it, but really a big push around, well, Azure AD Join would generally be the better solution if you can. And then not technology related at all, I did one of my virtual mentoring videos because it, it seemed to be coming up quite a bit. Picking your hard, how to think about handling when you have hard things ahead of you, maybe a way to balance that mindset. May help for some people. On to what's new. So on the compute side, so the memory centric V5, so the EB, so remember the B, is focused around block storage performance. So for the EBS v5 and the EBDS v5, D means it has local temporary storage as well, now has an NVMe interface option. So ordinarily, the remote storage connectivity is, is SCSI um, protocol. So now I have the option of using an NVMe interface on these. Now, I need to be Gen 2, um, the VM OS image has to be tagged with NVMe support. But if I do this, I can actually attain higher IOPS and throughput. It's not an additional cost, but now I do have the option as part of the creation of these, I'll see the ability to use NVMe. And what this is really just going to do, if we just jump over super quickly, is this walks through the ability to enable that NVMe and SCSI interface on the virtual machines. It talks about the images supported, what you'll see in the portal, hey, you're gonna see this new option for the higher storage performance with NVMe. And really what it will boil down to is when you then go and look at that EBV5, you're gonna see some different performance specifications on if it's using SCSI, i.e the old one, and if I select the option to use NVMe, the newer one, and you'll see some of these numbers are different, like the E96 um, has these, we have these bigger capabilities available to us, you're just gonna see some different numbers. So you can go and compare those. It's not gonna be massive um, for most of these things, but there'll be some maybe burst capabilities, you can go and track through them. But that NVMe would definitely be the uh, preferred approach going forward if the image you choose will actually support it. So I think it's the first VM SKU that gives you that NVMe interface um, protocol option um, in Azure. On the networking side, so the next generation firewall from Palo Alto Networks is now available as an Azure native ISV service. So it's a collaboration between Microsoft and Palo Alto. So it's gonna give you all of the cutting edge features you think about of a next generation firewall, but it's gonna have that simplicity. Hey, it's an Azure Marketplace item. It's gonna be able to be managed either through the Palo Alto policy solution, or I can use the Azure portal. So I get to pick that when I deploy it. I can use the Azure ARM role-based access controls. The billing will be part of the Azure subscription invoicing, and I can deploy it into a virtual network and, well, or, an Azure Virtual WAN. So if I'm using the Azure Virtual WAN as that managed hub for my environment, I can deploy it into there as well. On the storage side, so zone redundant storage disks, so that's where, hey, I always have copies of the data. With zone redundant, those copies are distributed over the availability zones in that region. And so managed disks now support ZRS in some new regions. I think it's Southeast Asia, Australia East, and Qatar Central. So I can now use those now. And blob cold access tier is now in preview. So we're used to with storage, the idea of access tiers. We're used to the hot tier, the 
called here an archive. So hot, I pay the most for the storage, but the least for transactions. Call, I pay less for the storage, but more for the transactions. Archive, I pay a tiny amount, but I can't get to it, it's offline. I have to hydrate it back. And so I would think about the use of that. Hey, if it's data I'm constantly interacting with, hey, I'll store it in the hot tier. If it's data I need immediately available to me, but I interact with it less, I'll put it in the cool tier. If it's data I just have to store, hey, I'll stick it in archive. But if I stick it in archive, there's a delay to get access to it again. So what they're doing with this new cold access tier, it's, well, it's gonna cost me even less to store it. So if we go and look at the pricing, we can see this new cold tier is even cheaper than even cool. But then what will happen is when I want to interact with it, so if I look at the cold, I pay more for the interactions. So once again, it's that balance. And where I think this will fit really nicely is, well, it, it's data that I don't, anticipate interact with hardly ever, but if I do have to interact with it, I cannot wait for it to be hydrated back from archive. And once again, this will work with the existing APIs, this will work with the lifecycle management policies, it's another option. So if I'm used to maybe Glacier in other clouds, this would be an equivalent of that. So it's really, really cheap storage. It's stuff that I don't anticipating interacting with often at all, because I'm gonna pay more for the transactions when I actually do. That's in preview. On the database side, so if I'm using Azure Databricks, that managed solution um, using Databricks, there's now a serverless SQL. What this means is if, if I want to run a query, if I want to run a report against my data, well, I'm only gonna pay for the compute when I need to perform those operations. So if I'm using Power BI, for example, and I wanna run an analysis against data in a data lake, this will be fantastic. It will just spin up and I'll pay for the exact amount I'm using and then I stop paying for it again. So really useful for any of my BI, my SQL type workloads. And then miscellaneous, uh, Azure Backup Server v4 has gone generally available. So Azure Backup Server is a component I install and it's designed to be used for my infrastructure to protect workloads. This could be Hyper V VMs, it could be VMware VMs, it could be Azure Stack HCI VMs, it could be my file service, it could be my databases, and it then goes and protects them uh, into my recovery services vault. So what this does is it now supports Windows Server 2022 with SQL Server 2022. I can protect VMs running on Azure Stack HCI um, 22H2, VMware 8, it can use private endpoints for the communication to the backup reco recovery services vault. So remember, a private endpoint is an IP address in a particular virtual network that corresponds to a specific instance of a service. Well, it's an IP address. So if I have that private endpoint sitting up there in a virtual network, if I had, for example, express route private peering, to my on-premises network, I can get and use that IP address. I have a certain DNS record added for the private link record, but then I can use it. So if I have that express route, for example, between my on-prem and a virtual network up there of a private endpoint, I could now use that IP address to go and talk to the backup recovery services vault. I don't need to use the public endpoint. And that was it. I said it was a quick week. As always, I hope that was useful. And until next video, take care.